Everything that I know about ultrafine particles amounts to nothing. About ultrafine particles? Well, I know there's some ultrafine particles roaming around space. Oh my god, I have no idea. <laughs> I know absolutely nothing about ultrafine particles. And they're probably particles that are either extremely attractive or very small. This is the densest city in New England that has one of the heaviest burdens of pollution. You have a lot of people in a small space being exposed to a lot of pollution. There were some really bad mistakes made when they built I-93 that we're still paying for in terms of people's health. The people who live within 50 or 100 meters of the highway, those people have a uniquely high exposure to fresh mobile pollution that no one else in the same community has. I've been working for the Maine Turnpike for almost 24 years and I love my job. The heat brings, you know, a lot of the pollution levels down sometimes, but sometimes, you know, the company will come by every couple of years and they put this little monitor on us and their little thing to breathe in and so they test the air quality. So and, um, I think they said the, the air quality was, was, was fair. You know, when you've been here as long as I have, you learn that, you know, fans do help, help keep that, the elements in the air out of the booth. Sometimes they don't. Like I say, you know, catalytic converters break on vehicles. Yeah, you smell it. You know, tractor trailer trucks, cars, vans, they all overheat. You know, you smell the brakes, but you know, you just try to just keep doing your job. It doesn't really affect us in the ways that some people think it would. I think most of the public is unaware of particulate matter as a serious concern. Uh, if you ask people about their environmental health concerns, I don't think most of them would say, oh, I'm concerned about particulate matter in the air. The fine particles are associated with about a quarter million deaths a year in the U.S. Now, the U.S. doesn't have two and a half million deaths a year. It has a little less than that. So what that means is those fine particles that you really don't notice, those are associated with more than 10 percent of all deaths in the United States, which is a pretty large number. The EPA regulates um, a suite of of different air pollutants. We measure most of those, um, but they don't yet regulate UFP, which is ultrafine particles. Ultrafine particles that are just one element in the emissions that come from car exhaust and truck exhaust and vehicle exhaust. And they're very tiny. They're so tiny that you could fit about 20,000 of them in a grain of salt. If you blew up a human hair to like, like if this was, I don't know, like a, a diameter of taller than me, then an ultrafine particle would be like this big. What we know a lot about are the larger particles, that, which are the fine particles. For the ultrafines, which are the tiniest of the tiniest of the tiniest particles, we have much less of an idea. I'm currently the principal investigator on the core study, the, the main project for CAFE. So CAFE stands for Community Assessment of Freeway Exposure and Health Study. Our hypothesis is that the people who are more affected by ultrafine particles are the people who are living close to highways. So what we're trying to do is create um, an understanding of the pollution levels in a certain neighborhood. When we first looked at the mortalities for all 351 cities and towns of Massachusetts, what we found was that in eastern Massachusetts, of the 100 cities and towns which surround Boston, that 14 of them had 75 percent of the excess mortality. And the map of the 14 communities looks like the regional transportation map.
We have a recreational vehicle that was torn apart and had all this instrumentation installed in it. We've drilled through this thing in every which way. Um, we have two generators that that power the whole thing. It's been a process, uh, a lot of a lot of hands-on, but it, it worked out well, and it's still, you know, three years later, still functioning. The RV does all of the mobile monitoring along neighborhoods that are close to the highways. We started monitoring in Somerville, last year in Dorchester, South Boston, and then now in Chinatown and Malden. So this is the coffee shop we stopped at. <laughs> so like Dress will should sit out here and then I'll run in and get two ice lattes. <laughs> and it takes this is at like at 530. Yeah. Morning. It takes one of the instruments a little while to get to the right temperature. So usually we like set it up, drive over here, and then while we're getting the coffees it has time to get to the right temperature. So it really works out perfectly. So these are our gas phase instruments and then everything on this side does particles. The air comes into this instrument. This separates it, separates the particles into different sizes. Then it will send it in those ranges through to this instrument, which will then count the number of particles in different ranges. The reason we're looking at UFPs is because these particles, the smaller they are, the more harmful they can be. So they're very sneaky. They can just bypass all of your natural um, protective mechanisms in your respiratory system and even in the cell membranes. It's hypothesized that they can permeate and get into different parts of the system. Is ultrafine particles a economic and environmental justice issue? Well, yeah. I mean, look where highways go. They don't go through Dover. They don't go through Wellesley. They go through Somerville. They go through the working class communities. The way they literally put Interstate 93 in Somerville was they kind of unzipped a couple miles of blocks of very dense neighborhoods and took them out. They moved those people and then they shoehorned the highway in. What that meant was the people who were left were really close to the highway. We go to cities because we need to be with other people. We need both the freedom and the connection. And unfortunately though, what we've spent the last 50, 75 years is ripping down our cities to build highways out to the outer suburbs. We are at uh, Mystic Housing. This is Somerville's largest public housing project. And then up above is Interstate 93, which carries over 150,000 people in and, or vehicles in and out of Boston every day. Mi nombre es María Guadalupe Ojeda. Soy de México. Yo tengo 15 años viviendo aquí. Si pasan carros que te sacan bastante humo, entra mucha tierra al, al apartamento. Incluso en las mismas ventanas no dura ni un día limpia. Se ve ahí. Tú puedes checar alrededor de las ventanas y está, pero tapizado de, de polvo, smog, de diferentes partículas que hay en el ambiente. Esto viene siendo lo que es la, la sala de mi, de mi apartamento, la cocina y el baño, y luego la recámara de mi niña. Si te das cuenta, se, de las arañas, arañas, y luego más los polvitos, imagínate, todo eso es... Está súper sucio ahí y pienso yo que todo eso nos hace daño para nuestra salud. We pay particular attention to Mystic Housing uh, because it's got a population of concern. It's a, it's a vulnerable population. Uh, it's got some socioeconomic challenges. Uh, some of the people here have health challenges. Mis tres hijos desafortunadamente tienen asma. El mayor es, tiene asma crónica. Por parte de mi familia, de, de mis papás, nunca había habido asma. Por parte de mi esposo, solo mi suegra ha tenido asma. Nada más, pero nadie más ha tenido asma. Rates of asthma in children have been increasing, uh, and that's well recognized over the past several decades. Uh, the reasons for that are not entirely clear, but we do know that uh, there are environmental and air pollution factors that are contributors. My name is Moises. When I'm in my room, like when I'm sleeping, I I always cough when my when my windows like open because of the cars when there's a lot of smoke of the cars. 
children are more susceptible to air pollution than adults are for a number of different reasons. For one thing, 80% of the alveoli or the little um, pockets of air where the, across which the air exchange occurs in the lung, 80% of those little bubbles are formed after birth. Their lungs are still developing. So when you're developing, the cells are developing, you know, when you introduce something that's, that's toxic, you know, it, it can have a greater effect at that life stage. Supuestamente ya tiene que dormir de este lado, pero como está la ventana aquí y tiene el heat todo aquí alrededor, todo eso le produce este, que la no se le con, congestione, entonces hago que se duerma de este lado para que este, el vapor del, del heat no le afecte igual de la, de la ventana, los polvos que entran, no, este, no los respire directamente. This is um, the background site for Chinatown. This kind of gives a sense of what the regional air quality is. They also do blood tests and health surveys of people who are constantly being exposed. So, people say, this is good, it's good, it's good. I don't think it's good. It's like now, like we're here. 你朝早抹乾淨了玻璃到晚黑回來呢很多塵了你已經過油了這行路有時候你開了會很厲害 Often the homes that we're going into and where we're driving are of low socioeconomic status. Those people are really paying the price for the rest of our convenience of getting in and out of the city by car. It's a very unfair distribution of benefits and cost. Oh, definitivamente he pensado mudarme a otro lado, pero mis recursos económicos no me dan. Y de hecho, pues eso ha sido pues no es que realmente haya querido venirme a vivir aquí a los proyectos pero no tenía otra opción porque las rentas afuera son muy caras. I'm definitely proud of the work that I get to do as part of this study. Um, I think it's it's really important because it because it affects people's health. These neighborhoods, it would be great to help them in any way that we can to support policy that would help them because they often lack that power. The uh, purpose for the research that's happening right now is to really build the case that this is something that's fallen through the cracks um, and that should be regulated and there should be standards for these particles. Unless that you can really scientifically prove that the health risks are related to the transportation or whatever the, the factor might be, nothing legislatively will change. We have a commitment to play an active role in trying to translate our findings in the broader literature into policy and practice in, in the short term rather than just waiting passively to hope that that happens. After CAFE, the next steps are going to be to try to figure out what can we do to mitigate these risks. Just getting people to acknowledge that there is a problem. And that's, again, that is hard when it's something that is all around us because we're used to thinking about environmental pollution as, ah, you know, this, we can react to this because we can see that, you know, a stream coming out of the, the stack over there. You know, we hear of sort of a crisis, but when it's something that we're living with every day, it's hard to know how to respond in a way that doesn't seem alarmist, but yet is responsible. 
when you build a highway or think of transportation, one of the things you've got to evaluate is what will be the impact on the health of the people using it and the health of the people around it. Maybe we pay attention to where we place new pocket parks in the community and we, we try to get those to be in places that are healthier. Maybe we pay attention to where people walk and bike. We're midstream. We haven't finished our analysis yet and so even the models of ultrafine air pollution near the highway are not, are not done. But we should be pushing our government, our public agencies, that give us more direct hooks to talk about the public health of our shared environment. They have got to start looking at the evidence. They have got to start acknowledging that these are huge health impacts. And that in a larger sense is a societal issue because it's not just the immediate downwind people. They get it the worst, but it's the rest of us as well. And I think it's something that can unite people of all economic backgrounds, all racial backgrounds, no matter where they live. This is not 